Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Hope Lafferty's Existential Crisis, the podcast for creativity and other phenomena. I'm your hostess with the mostest, Hope Lafferty. <clears throat> Happy to share another episode. My episode, your episode, your choice of episodes. You know, you have a choice in episodes, and we are so happy that you've chosen an episode of The Existential Crisis. I I want you to sit back and relax. Wait. <laughs> a little down the rabbit hole there. If you wanted to relax and get comfortable, um, well, you probably chose the wrong podcast for that. So stand up, brace yourselves, because we're about to crash. Let's start this week with a piece of writing that I like to call Flight Path. Let's listen. Mind chap amid the whir of air conditioning fans and clicks, rotating blades blaring the hot, moist air around the room, blowing sheets and drying sweat on the back of the never-tanned skin that hid from the heat under the non-vented attic holding in the hot cake of August after five months of breaking 90 in the late 90s. That Eddie Money tune chimed alarm with the Southwest 737 overhead, shaking the pier and beam, awakening feral kitty with no surname that lived under the tub. I need some water. 710. Still night outside, except for the sterile acridity that disguised itself as a spring morning. So far west in the time zone, you felt as if you were in the mountains. Or better, the desert dead zone just beyond the mountains, with tumbleweeds blowing across the living room, propelled only by the window unit. Not so feral, yet the jury was still out. Dogs, in the car lot that posed as a backyard next door, barked after the jet, in hopes to hurt it fighting and chiming their chains on dirt and displaying their heretofore yet unproven expression as smart dogs. Somebody give them some water. Hadn't rained in at least six weeks, so the toilet bowl, bird bath, drinking fountain from which these demonic hybrids of Rottweiler and Cujo slaked was filled only with iron stains and sun-dried canine saliva. Perhaps in barking, They hoped the 737 would eject the famed blue gel and they would soak their muzzles in damp human loin candy. Always had to turn on the light to enter the kitchen, even though daybreak eked through the one kiltered second thought of a window above the sink. Never liked bright light pre-dawn, felt it too abrupt to be good for human development like the quasi-paleolithic experience that darkness would yield even less, preferring to close my eyes to the 75 watts and let the tree roaches and any amphibious life forms scamper into the darkness before my approach to wet my whistle. When we first moved in, before we took note of the crunching sounds, we discovered small pellet droppings only on the counter by the sink, sizable enough to make us believe that we had mice. The first time we came in from the living room, flicked on the light catching about 15 three-inch tree roaches in the act, we decided to always leave the lights on in the kitchen. Always close and lock the bedroom door adjacent to the kitchen. We were convinced that those little buggers had opposable thumbs and regularly wear kick-offable shoes in case we needed to go on a killing spree. The spree became one of our nightly rituals, both in the kitchen and in the bathroom. Twice, I found myself confronted with the beasts in bed with me, which trained my reflexes beyond striking out at Shay. Neither the neighbor's dogs nor the cat under the house assisted in the kills, arguably too immediate a threat for those that seek manna from heaven. By the third incident of me feeling these sticky, prickly feet across my forehead, nose, and lips, I knew that we needed to move. Third world existence was not my cup of tea. And after that, I needed more than a drink of water. Austin, Texas, everybody. (laughs) Boy, did I have a good time there. 
Oh boy, the vocabulary. Let's talk a little bit about vocabulary for a moment, and uh, and how how at least the initial part of of that work um, was a lot of sound play, a lot of playing with the sounds, the hooked on phonics way of writing. Uh, when we're working with free writes, which just as a quick reminder is where you just open up your brain and you kind of apply it to the page. Um, you allow yourself, or at least I allow myself, to kind of flow with the the language mosaic, the 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 tangents that come out, and and the playing with the sounds and the playing with the thoughts. Sometimes it's sounds, sometimes it's images, sometimes it's sometimes it's smells, sometimes it's any kind of sensory experience. So so really play with that, and you know, kind of embrace the word salad that uh, that shows up, and keep going with the movement of it as you saw that this was a lot of just kind of playing out the ideas of like oh this is this situation with the dogs or this situation with the tub or this situation with with just how hot and summer-like and oppressive that it was I think the music also helped and I didn't compose that and that came later uh, than the writing so uh the music that you might be writing to though will also affect Um, and allow it to affect where your brain goes with this and just kind of keep working with the free, the free images that show up, the language, the sounds, the smells, the, 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 the way your brain wants to move. And then a story will start to show up as you saw, eventually it's like, oh, and then we just kind of like become practical and talk about the house and talk about like, oh yeah, and this is, this is what we have to deal with is the three inch tree roaches. Yes. Three inch. Those of you that are from the North, um, or the East or someplace that doesn't have, um, insects that are the size of the palm of your hand. Yes, they exist. And, uh, they live in your house. How about that? That's a fun one. So, um, you know, explore those things that you might experience or those things that you can only imagine or the things that you're afraid to imagine in your own writing or in your own creation. Um, and just kind of play, follow your brain, allow your mind to unfold when you work on the free rights. And maybe you'll get something juicy if not coherent, out of the time you spend. Welcome to This Week in Existence. So I'm uh, I'm going to the gym again. <laughs> I do this every once in a while. <laughs> I go to the gym. I join a gym. I am members of gyms all over the country that are not locally in my town, which why I, anyway. <laughs> but you know, I'm not seeing the results. Well, I'm seeing results. And I'm seeing physical results that are not displeasing to me. I'm very happy about that. Um, but it's the mental results that are are kind of going against conventional wisdom that makes me call into question uh, what what does working out what, what does working out mean? What am I working out? Right? What am I working out? Oh my God! Uh, it's you know, I, all right. I have to admit, I'm I'm kind of prone to suggestion. Let's 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 start there. I'm prone to suggestion. I am one of those subscribers to a healthy diet, Mediterranean diet, uh, regular exercise, uh, meditation, self awareness, good communications with the people around you. I'm one of those people. Um, perfectionist, maybe a control freak, probably. Uh, you know, but I'm but you know, I kind of. I, I really believe that all of those things help me be as good a human as I can be, right? I mean, that's mm-hmm. kind of, again, the whole idea of like self-actualization is I really want to be, you know, not waste my time here somehow. Um, even if I am spinning my own wheels, I'm at least spinning my wheels um, for the good, <laughs> using my powers uh, for good. Yeah, so I'm using my powers for good. I'm going to the gym. 
And I know that's really annoying. And just for the re- just for the record, I'm not super hardcore at the gym. I don't have a hardcore. I have got a very soft, mushy core. And yeah, six pack jokes aside. Uh, but I I I'm kind of forgiving with myself. You know, I take breaks. You know, I allow myself to be human. I eat ice cream for supper sometimes. I have to admit, I uh, if I'm really being truthful, I eat ice cream and beer for supper sometimes. Um, not the same, not as a float, although depending on the beers are getting pretty imaginative these days, as are ice creams. Anyway, but <clears throat> I've, I've never gone off gluten and I don't go to the gym every day. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not super hard on myself that way, but I go to the gym and I do exercise and I meditate and mostly because I don't want to be inconvenienced, right? I don't want to have to interrupt what I'm after. Yeah, so I'm I am a control freak. Okay, so control freak. Yeah. So I just re-upped, you know, the self care. I just started going to the gym again about three weeks ago because I've been feeling a little frumpy. Um, and I haven't changed anything else. My diet's still good. I meditate twice a day. I, you know, I my life circumstance is good. And after three weeks, my body is feeling better, but my mind, I'm my mood my level of agitation, my level of irritability, my self-confidence, they've all gone, they've all kind of been shaken. Now, wait a second. I thought that exercise is a mood booster. You know, all the magazines and the websites and the talk shows, they all say that. They've been saying that for decades. If you want to feel better, eat some sugar, have some caffeine. No, eat you know, those things too. But if you want to feel better, you know, go to the gym, exercise, get off the couch, go do something. Okay. Yep. And I think about my history of working out and I'm thinking, wait a second, this isn't the first time that I've worked out and started to get fit that I actually have a negative mental experience. For example, about 10 years ago, I was, I was quite fit and I was like going after being, being particularly fit. Again, this is relative. You know, I wasn't Alyssa Milano in her twenties, but I was fit And the weird thing started happening after about six months of being, you know, kind of at my peak for that age, definitely peak. And one of the peaks in my life, I started losing weight kind of unintentionally. And I started becoming less interested in the circumstances around me. I really didn't care for my job or my life, which were all good. I mean, on paper, they were all good. And I had to kind of force myself to eat. Well, don't forget to eat. Because, again, I'm practical and I believe in taking care of myself. And <clears throat> then I noticed one day I walked into our conference room, which is on the, the 13th floor. The four, not really the 13th floor. It was on the 14th floor, but it was on the 13th floor. Um, <laughs> and I walked in the conference room and it was this beautiful windowed corner conference room uh, that overlooked Fifth Avenue. And I, and I walk in and I look out and I'm like, oh, I can't be in here. I don't feel safe with all these windows. Um, So I kind of took that as a marker. It's like, okay, this is a problem. Okay, so you're fit. So you're working out. So you're exercising. So you're feeling good, feeling good physically. Best I've ever felt. And then my mind is just kind of decompensating. It's like, okay, not like beyond recognition, but certainly there's a mood. There's a mood that that is going down. Um... And so I basically took five weeks off of work, went to Texas for most of that time, <laughs> thought out basically, I guess it wasn't that late in the year, but, um, and it was just kind of a rehab that I was able to, you know, kind of restart myself. It's like, okay, press the reset button, feel better, go back, go back to work, feel rejuvenated, feel better, eat regular and kind of quit with the exercise for a bit. Just kind of quit. Well, about five years ago, four or five years ago, I was, we, my husband and I were at this in um, in Nashville, Tennessee, and there's lots of gyms around there. So I, was, I said, hey, maybe I should start working out again. I'm feeling a little frumpy again. Let's, uh, let's go back to the gym. But I'm like really scared because the last time I kind of had this major, major depressive episode, right? <laughs> and it's like, oh, all right, well, this might happen. I'm already telling him that this might happen. And I was really worried if I joined a gym that something negative psychologically would happen again. And sure enough, despite my level of awareness, despite that I'm not hardcore, I'm a no pain, no pain kind of person. 
As I began to get fit and tone and toit, I had hypomania. I had insomnia. I was irritable. I had these weird flashes of rage. I started to attribute it to maybe perimenopause, right? I've heard a lot about that. I don't know what that is. But all the exercise and all the self-awareness and all the, you know, communication just was not preventing certain just reactions, shall we say. So the week I turned 30, I acquiesced. I started an SSRI. I can't even say it. I started an SSRI or what I used to call the shut up lady medicine. I have to say it helped. It helped a lot. But you know how much I believe in self-actualization and so I'm always evaluating my life and I'm, you know, even though I'm on like, you know, kind of a mood stabilizer and it's not really a mood stabilizer. It's just kind of helping me sleep and not, you know, bite my husband's head off uh, <laughs> for no reason. Um, I believe in really experiencing life and humanity and all that nougaty goodness that comes out. And after about a year, I started self-reflecting again. It's like, you know, I'm not doing what I want to be doing with my life. I built a nice business. I like my life. I like where I live. We had moved back from, from Nashville. We moved back to the, to the, to the hinterlands of, of Texas. And, um, but I'm feeling restless and I'm feeling like, you know, I think I want to change what I do. And that was when I started exploring this dramatist space. And I've been, you know, studying in earnest for the last couple of years. And so when I decided to take it up a notch and move to the East coast and study, um, a few months back, I weaned myself off of the psychotropics and I bought a weighted blanket and I learned transcendental meditation. So this was like, again, how I am self-actualizing. I mean, honestly, I'm my own Skinner box. <laughs> Those of you who don't know who B.F. Skinner is, you'll start getting the joke why it was Principal Skinner of the Simpsons. Anyway, I won't go into that, but I'm my own Skinner box. I start feeling good. I'm off the meds. I'm feeling good. I'm, I'm, I get back here after being uh, on the East Coast, and I'm ready to work out again. And bam, I get this weird mood thing again. I'm starting to get irritable, and I'm starting to get a little depressed. And I'm thinking back to even younger when I first learned how to do weight machines, which I love weight machines, and I read that, you know, resistance exercises is... The workout you're supposed to do as you age, and I love doing that, but my mood is starting to like not be what I want it to be just because I started exercising. So I'm talking to my doc this week, realizing that the irritability and the depression are here. And I'm making the connection between exercise and mood in a way that is it is not commonly acknowledged. I mean, I want to be fit. I don't want to be short of breath. I kind of need to use my body if this is the career that I'm moving into, that I need this vessel to work for me. I want to master it in its way, you know, where it is today. But I also, I don't know, not have my husband feel like our marriage is a minefield. I don't want to fly off the handle. I love that term, flying off the handle. I don't know what handle it is, but I'm flying off of it. It's this dark underbelly of exercise, of perfectionism, of, of listening to popular thought. And do I keep exercising? Well, yes. Do I trust that I can do it unaided by the miracle of pharmaceuticals? Well, I have to admit, not yet. Is this always going to be a trade-off? Is life always a trade-off? Is this perfectionism versus humanity? Striving versus vulnerability? I don't know. I don't have an answer. I hear that... uh, Maybe we all live with the trade-off. Did I say brace yourselves? Boy, I want to thank Andy Schneider, the host with the most... My producer and founder of the Marfa Channel, the good folks here at Alamito, and of course, you all, all y'all. Let me know what sends you into the depths of your humanity. Let me know what gets you to the gym. Let me know if you uh, read too many popular magazines and are too influenced by 
conventional thought. <laughs> Tweet me at the Hope Crisis. You know you want to. This week's closing mantra is something that I need to remind myself, like perpetually. <laughs> Go easy on yourself. Stop being such a hard ass. Have ice cream and beer for supper. And always, look after yourselves. <laughs>